Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. The United States on Wednesday circulated a draft resolution to the United, Security, uh, United Nations Security Council that would blacklist JEM chief Masood Azhar as a terrorist, setting up a potential clash with China over the move. China, earlier this month, put on hold a request to put Masood Azhar on the UN sanctions list. That request stalled in a UN sanctions committee, prompting the US to turn directly to the Security Council with a proposed resolution blacklisting Azhar. jaish e Mohammed claimed responsibility for the February 14th attack in Kashmir that killed 40 Indian troops and stoked tensions between India and Pakistan. The draft resolution obtained by a media organization AFP condemns the suicide bombing and decides that Azhar will be added to the UN Al-Qaeda and Islamic State sanctions blacklist. It remained unclear when a vote would be held on the draft resolution, which could face a veto from China, one of the five permanent council members, along with Britain, France, Russia and the United States. There have been four attempts through a UN sanctions committee to add Azhar to the blacklist. China blocked three previous requests and put a technical hold on the latest one, which could last up to nine months. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the new move by the U.S. to blacklist Masood Azhar at the U.N. Joining me on the program today are Vivek Karju, former ambassador, Major General Dhruv C. Katoch, retired director, India Foundation, and Professor Harshvi Pant, head strategic studies, Observer Research Foundation. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, I'd like to begin the program with you. So what do you make of the latest draft resolution that has been moved by the United States? I think it clearly demonstrates the exasperation of the international community, not only the US, France and the UK, with Chinese behavior in respect of Masood Azhar. When you have 14 of the 15 members of the, uh, UNSC. the UNSC and the uh, 1267 committee, saying that they are okay with the listing of Masood Azhar as a terrorist, then with China blocking it on technical grounds, only demonstrates China, the Sino-Pakistani nexus. And the, interestingly, the Chinese have continued paying a price, not only with respect to India, but now with respect to the international community. So, the crunch time has come. And uh, the Chinese have been clearly told that on terrorism, your double standards can no longer be accepted. Right. Uh, General, that having been said, what has prompted the US to come up with this latest resolution, considering there was one just two weeks ago? Now, you know, um, let us understand that there is a difference between 1267 mm. and what is going to happen now. Now, when 1267 took place, and yes, there were those 15 members there, and 14 of them uh, uh, voted, uh, voted to declare Masood Azhar as, the, uh, 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 as a terrorist, you see, and place him on that list along with Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Now, those meetings are actually held in a closed door. Now, what is going to happen is, and China, as you mentioned uh, in your opening uh, remarks, you know, put a technical hold over it. Now, now what is going to happen is when it goes into the UN, uh, gen when the UN, United Nations Security Council, when the members sit there, this is an open assembly. And China has got no options. It cannot put a technical hold. It can either veto or it can go along with it. So I think the first thing which the Americans have done is to put the Chinese on the spot. Are you going to veto this and show to the world that you are supporting a terrorist organization? Or are you going to go along with the rest of the world? So I think there the stakes are now very, very um, clear. And I think for China, it is going to become increasingly difficult. Uh, China is, on a, is in a spot. Let us face it. China is in a spot because it sees it, uh, its support to Pakistan as critical to its own foreign policy. That is one aspect of it. Besides the $60 billion of aid for the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, they are also looking at Pakistan as a strategic ally which can neutralize India. Mm. So that is really the Chinese game plan as far as, this, uh, the, as far as Pakistan is concerned. 
Now, at the, at the other end of the spectrum, we are looking at terrorism, which is a global war on terror in which the whole world is affected. Now, China has to choose. So far, it has played a double-edged game. They've tried to show that they are with the uh, global community as far as fighting terror is concerned. But they have always dithered on this particular issue. And while dithering, they have actually sought to gain time. Now, I think that what the US is really doing now is to putting a, is putting the thing on on uh, a yes or no basis. You see, now I think they they're leaving China with no option. They have to come out clearly, either way. Right. And either way, whichever course China takes now, I'm afraid China is going to lose. So, so, so they have, so, they have so, boxed them in into a situation right. by which China is playing a lose lose game, and it has to commit itself. I think so, that is what the stakes are now. So to sum it up, basically what the United States is doing now is, you know, exposing China's yes. double standards basically Absolutely. and making China to come out in the open. Come out in the open. That's right. right. Professor, uh, so what happens to the previous resolution and the technical hold then? Well, I think it gets, uh, at the moment, for the moment, it gets subsumed by this, uh, by, the, uh, by what uh, perhaps uh, the, the government, uh, by, by what Mr., sorry, the, the U.S. is trying to do. Uh, but I think... Uh, you know, the, the, in some ways, there are parallel processes. It can continue. It, it will, uh, uh, it, it will uh, continue on a separate trajectory. Uh, and this being at the moment the defining sort of nodal agency which, which takes this forward uh, will, um, will carry on. Uh, and so you, you can, uh, you know, the, the technical hold uh, issue continues to remain where it is. Uh, and uh, the American and I think the Western attempt to put China on the spot, as was being discussed, uh, is, a, is, a, is a much larger issue because this, is, this issue pertains to uh, the larger uh, concepts of terrorism and how the world is looking at terrorism and what the challenges are and how the world can perhaps as a, as a community work together. Now, I think what is interesting is that there are two, two things. One is, you know, uh, as was pointed out, this is somehow uh, the... You know, the argument being that, look, we need to expose China. Uh, and you also had that statement from uh, the Secretary of State saying that, look, you know, you have a, you have a position on Uyghur Muslims, uh, which is horrific. And there is a position on Pakistani-sponsored terrorism, which is quite, di quite distinct. So you have this Masood Azhar equation vis-a-vis -vis what you are doing to the, to the domestic local population in, in China itself, where China takes two divergent positions. And therefore, it is important that this comes out in, into the open, but I think there is another element here, which is uh, which is perhaps uh, also equally interesting, is that uh, for the West uh, and for a lot of the international community, it is important that Masood Azhar's issue uh, becomes important and is flagged up in the international system, because uh, you know India has also changed the game in South Asia. So you have now a certain sense that look, India has also you know we we need to reassure India that international communities stands with India. And I, th and I think, therefore, these demonstrations are important. There's this idea that uh, the, 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 the West is coming together uh, and is showing solidarity with, in, with India is important. Right. Because otherwise, India is also now showing that it is capable of taking certain actions, which many in, in the international community may find that will bring greater instability into the, into the region. So I think there, is, there are two, two parallel tracks that are happening, which uh, by doing what India did post Pulwama, India has also changed those equations insofar as the global understanding of the regional situation and environment is concerned. Right. So there's a global effort really to try and tackle the problem of terrorism on the whole is what you're suggesting. And we are seeing the world move together as one in that particular direction. Uh, Ambassador, are we going to witness, taking the discussion forward now, are we going to witness some kind of a showdown between the United States and China at the UN? Look, if you had asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have answered straight away that China doesn't like to stand isolated publicly. Mm. And if you recollect, that was the whole issue when the NSG exemption was being debated. The Chinese were isolated. I think the Americans and the West had been successful in boxing them in and uh, they won't stand alone. With Xi Jinping, the Chinese are not worried about standing alone. If they had been so worried, they would not have put this technical hold so soon after Pulwama. Uh, the question now is whether on terrorism per se, they would be willing to take the heat for the Pakistanis. 
the voices coming out of pakistan are equivocal there is a segment within pakistan which is saying that we can't expect china to bail us out and embarrass itself all the time and therefore on masood azhar if there has to be some give let us allow chinese to really have that give on the other hand the die hard people are saying no on masood azhar we need to teach the indians and continue to teach the indians a lesson with chinese support so as of now the chinese i think will have will be weighing their options very very closely now one other thing the 1267 committee if you recollect goes back to 1999 right. yeah and it was it was put into effect if i recollect correctly soon after 911 when there was the need to isolate uh, al qaeda and at that stage all these entities were put in and the jaish e mohammed is listed the masood azhar is not, not listed yeah. but the organization is listed and I, it's ironic that the head of the organization is allowed to to have this freedom so uh, i do think that this particular move is on a different track altogether because that is under chapter 7 mm. and uh, the countries have no option member states have no options but to adhere to the to that resolution in its entirety it's a different matter that the pakistanis have played fast and loose with 12672 and the world has allowed them to do so but this particular resolution i'm my sense is i think uh, there isn't enough information now uh, as of now but my sense is that this will not be under chapter 7 it will be therefore non binding mm. so it's more of a demonstration effect and i agree with harsh that uh, the west is now trying to indicate to india that if there is god forbid another terrorist attack then it should look at options other than the options that it is spelling out in what to my mind is still a somewhat evolving doctrine mm. which is this and this is significant what we said as soon after balakot if you recollect the foreign secretary's exact words were that this is a non military preemptive action and that meant that if we see preparations for a major terrorist strike on india taking place in pakistan even if it is on sovereign pakistan territory mm. distinguishing it from pok we reserve the right to take kinetic action now that is a huge doctrinal shift and this is what the west to my mind has sensed and it is therefore preparing the ground to tell us that look in future as i said god forbid but in future tell us that look we are with you right right so how can we expect china to respond now general oh you see uh, as i had made in my earlier statement you know china is caught in a bind but i totally agree with the what ambassador kadju said and what uh, professor pant has said you see that makes eminent sense too that um, the world doesn't want india i mean I'll go to China's response a little bit later, but what India can do because um, terrorist strikes will continue. I don't, I don't see uh, Pakistan stopping or doing what it is doing. Ways, yeah. Right. So, it, so something will happen at some point of time, and uh, to say that we will be able to secure ourselves hundred percent of the time uh, is not really possible. So, I think um, the world would like us to believe, or would like India to say that okay, we'll help you, but ultimately it has to be India's call. and i think regardless of what the world does if something happens then we will take our call and i think it is going to be much more than what balakot is right and if you do not go beyond or if you don't do at least up to that level i think whichever government is in power is going to lose credibility it will be seen as being incapable of protecting the national interest so i think for the world their interest lies is in putting pressure on pakistan so the pressure of deescalation cannot lie on india the pressure of de escalation must lie on pakistan and it must close down each and every terror training camp right i think that is the bottom line so now china i think in this particular time china is china is getting very very worried and concerned it is not simply what is going to happen in the united nations security council where this vote will come up uh, which america uh, britain and france have voted now I think you also uh, look at the statement which Mike Pompeo has made today itself 
and that statement says that there are 1 million Muslim Uyghurs in concentration camps in China, which is a gross, viola a gross violation of their human rights. So I think that the Americans are putting pressure on their, on their own, on the Chinese, again, on this point too. I do not think it is going to be simply rest restricted to, uh, to, to the, on the terrorism front. I think it is going to go beyond. Right. So uh, how will China respond? Well, yes, uh, the ambassador very correctly said, Xi Jinping has said, we are prepared to go it alone. But I, my sense tells me that beyond a certain limit, I think the Chinese are, uh, will not really be able to do so. They will have to do a course correction. They, at how that cost correction takes place because the Chinese are very concerned about saving face. Mm. So will they put some pressure on Pakistan to do something or to change tack? We, I think we'll have to wait and see what Absolutely, exactly yeah. they will do. But they will have to do something. They, we cannot continue in the manner in which we are continuing as of now. So we can expect some change in the near future is what yes. you're suggesting. Yes, Ambassador. One possibility, given the way the UN works, is this. That if the language of this resolution is such that the Chinese can live with. Just as if you remember the presidential statement which came out after Pulwama. Yeah. That used the words that the attack that has been claimed by Jaish Muhammad. So if the and they went along with that. So if the language of this resolution is such that they can live with and if they negotiate this, then we can have a possibility that they go along with this resolution and yet maintain that hold, distinguishing between the requirements of 1267 and this resolution. Now, it's still too early for me to say conclusively whether mm. the Chinese will behave like this. But that is but a, that's possible, a possibility. That is a distinct possibility. Right. Professor, so is the Trump administration really trying to open up another front? Because we've seen everything happening, you know, with the trade war and so on and so forth. You know, domestically, Trump seems to have you know, done well. The people seem to have approved of what Trump has done as far as uh, the China trade war is concerned. So, this is, is the Trump administration trying to open up another front against China? See, there is no doubt that I think at this point, uh, after the Mueller, M Mueller report, uh, there is a certain bounce in, in, in the Trump administration. And Trump administration perhaps has also feels, uh, also feels um, that uh, what you know, in the, in the China policy, they have been relatively successful. If you recall, a few weeks back, there was a possibility of a deal on the table with the Chinese ac accepting many of the American demands, which is still is still on the table, is still being discussed. Uh, I think the question again there is who wins and who loses and how it is being presented uh, as to how, how China can present it as a not a, not a net uh, face-saving uh, issue. So I think uh, there are multiple fronts on which the Americans and the Chinese are engaging today. And more often than not, they are op in opposition to each other. And that oppositional context is, I think, what we are now going to witness here as well, where, uh, it, it, you know, it, to, a, to a lot of the world, it would seem as if you have the West on the side of India and China holding the Pakistani hand. Uh, and so this becomes, a, you know, the, this, this sort of a magnification of the South Asia problem into the larger global mm. problem. But I think uh, at, at some point, uh, you know, Chinese... Uh, are very good in, in doing deals and they are they are traditionally considered to be very pragmatic although they have in the past few years they have not been very pragmatic they have sort of presented themselves as the uh, you know as, as, as someone that is as, as a nation that is willing to change the rules of the game even at the cost of some of uh, some of their vital interests so I think uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, the way US China relationship is now building up uh, I would not rule out uh, a possibility where the two do not agree on coming to terms with each other because I think the most recent statement coming out of China is actually uh, saying that America is undermining the UN system. Uh, it's going, you know, the, the way it is now presenting this, uh, this issue to the UN uh, actually undermines the process through which then they've suddenly come back to the process and that this is not the right way in which this should be negotiated. It demeans the committee. Uh, so I think they are, they, are, they are using a language which is, which is about the processes and the structures of the United Nations. Again, somehow saying that, look, we believe in the structures. Uh, again, hypocrisy of a certain order that, look, we believe in the United Nations. We believe in this, uh, in this institution that is a certain way of functioning. You cannot really um, uh, corral us, uh, you know, uh, uh, take us uh, 
in a, in a, in a, in a direction uh, which uh, perhaps as a structure United Nations is not uh, possible um, of, of moving into. So I think it, it is going to be an interesting conversation and I think it would also at the end of the day tell us something very fundamental about, uh, about US-China relationship right. and where this is likely to go. Because see, we have had a lot of uh, assumptions in, the, in, in, recent, in, in recent months and, and years insofar as India-China relationship is concerned. Many people believed the Chinese at the end of the day would come back to the table on, uh, on NSG. Many people argued that, look, uh, Masood Azhar, perhaps China would do that. But they have not done it. So they have, they have stuck to a certain line, which is, which is they have taken a line which at some point many in India were arguing that, uh, that Chinese being very pragmatic, they would somehow uh, you know, look, look at India as a rising power and, and come to terms with it. They have not done any of that. So I think it is it is going to be one of those uh, one of those issues on which perhaps uh, we would we would get greater clarity about the direction in which China wants to go vis-a-vis -vis America policy because right. we know where it is going with vis-a-vis -vis India policy. Mm -hmm. But I think this is this is a much higher stakes uh, game that they are playing at the the larger global level. Another aspect to think about is the fact that the global economy is going through a slowdown at this point in time you know china is slowing down there are reports coming out of the united states that you know the united states could possibly be going into recession as well so these aspects also could possibly come up at some point in time ambassador but you know talking about processes that uh, the professor was pointing out what is the due process to be followed now that you know that no. the draft is in front of us no uh, the 1267 process the chinese are being completely hypocritical hmm. 14 of the 15 member countries of that committee say that India fulfills these requirements and that there is no bar to the listing of Masood Azhar under the, uh, under the 1267 resolution. Now, China is the only exception and that's not tenable. As far as this resolution is concerned, it's much too early. It's been introduced. Uh, I don't know if the text of the draft is still in the public domain. It, I haven't seen the draft. There have been reports on it. So, uh, the fact is that when a resolution like this is negotiated in the UNSC, there's a lot of give and take. And uh, what emerges at the end is a, the process of negotiation. Sorry to interrupt, but just uh, to better understand the yeah. process itself, are there back channel talks that take place? You know, how, how does it work really? Well, the PRs, the permanent representatives of the country concerned and their staff are in constant uh, uh, communication with regard to language. Mm -hmm. And the, the PRs in turn get, uh, are in constant communication with their capitals. Mm -hmm. So, there is a process taking place and sometimes if it's important enough, the capitals are in touch with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often, it all comes to language. Right. Again, I'm going back to hmm. the, the presidential statement because that was an unprecedented statement for, the, for many reasons after Pulwama. Uh, it, f there was a first statement which condemned an attack on military, Indian military forces. It was the first statement which used a formulation on Jammu and Kashmir which was quite distinct from the standard UN formulation on Jammu and Kashmir, on, on our state. Yes. So, and on again, and I'm repeating this, but it's important because what did the Chinese say, uh, what did the Chinese agree on with regard to the ownership of the attack? They said that the attack with jesh e Muhammad has claimed, which was distinct from a finding of the UN, as to who had perpetrated mm. that attack. Mm. So, what I am trying to say is that in this process itself, there is an enormous, enormous amount of scope so that a certain consensus is reached. And it well may happen that the Chinese, if they realize they don't want to stand alone on this, they may get they, a face saver. Then they, yes, then they say that we'll adhere to that because that is the real thing. Right, right. But this is something like the presidential statement. It will be much further and it will be a great achievement on the part of our diplomacy. Absolutely. And it will also show how American and uh, Chinese relations are moving, but it would be a distinct thing. Right, right. General, so uh, just to uh, make things clear, so what will blacklisting Masood Azhar really mean? How does it change things? 
Actually, you know, there have been many other people who have been blacklisted hmm. who are actually living in Pakistan exactly. and fundamentally there has been no change. But I think it is much more of a psychological ploy that, you know, at least it is out there in the open that here is uh, uh, Masood uh, Azhar and this man is blacklisted. Now, what it really means is that all financial transactions are frozen, right? Um, his group's financial transactions are frozen and he cannot travel anyway. So it puts those restrictions on this person. But I presume those uh, he's not traveling anywhere anyway. Anyway, yeah. Because uh, uh, if he travels out, I think uh, even within Pakistan, I'm not very sure whether he can sleep safely at night, right? Because he knows now that his life every night he sleeps, he does not know whether somebody will do an Osama bin Laden on him. So he's being protected. He's being protected by the Pakistan military. But r despite all that protection, there's always that element of doubt. So going abroad for this man is out of the question. He is a terrorist. He knows it and um, there is a right to kill, so to say, mm. you see. So if somebody gets him, well, it is par for the course. But over and uh, besides that, I really don't see what difference it will make, which is why I'm surprised at the Chinese stance. How does it make a difference to the Chinese? Why are they still doing it? Because on the ground, really, it will make no difference. So they will have to come to a via, uh, to some sort of um, uh, via media, via media with, with respect to what China uh, what Pakistan wants and what China is prepared to give. Right. Because China is uh, the, the larger, it's not so much the $60 billion of the CPEC, you know. Sure, sure. We keep talking about that. I think the larger thing is that strategic relationship which they have with Pakistan. So like so long as Pakistan can be used to keep India on the back foot, Pakistan is the supreme power in Asia and then uh, subsequently in the world. Absolutely. But if India is going to challenge China in Asia itself, now how can China even think of world supremacy? Absolutely. I look at it that way. Absolutely. You didn't say it in as many words, but just, you know, Paka, uh, Masood Azhar is just being used as a tool to needle uh, India. It's, it's yes. Uh, at absolutely. The end of, at at that, the end of the day. Way, yeah. Yes. Uh, Professor, close the show for us with your concluding remarks on what's likely to happen, you know, uh, in the global fight against terrorism. Well, I think uh, the, the most important lesson that I think we are learning, uh, especially in the context of what has happened recently, is that uh, India has shifted the goalposts not only for its own behavior, as was earlier pointed out, in, the, uh, in terms of its evolving security uh, posture, but also in terms of how the world has started looking at the region. And therefore, the onus is now on Pakistan and Pakistan's friends, including China, to, to bring down the tension in the region. And, and for that, it is important for the international community, important for those who look through the world through the similar prism, to stand by India to, and, and to make India aware of the, of the fact that they are standing by India. As, again, uh, Masood Azhar's blacklisting is not the point here. The point is that the world stands united, that the international community, that those who believe in a certain vision of the world stand united and they stand with India on this, on this very, very critical issue. So if there is going to be a consensus, that's well and good. But if no consensus, then we can expose those who are not willing to join that uh, struggle. Right. All right. On that note, then we'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. That's it from me. See you again next time.